finally I'm meeting these guys. <laughs> I tried to hook up with them for about two years. Two years. Three years. I keep mentioning them in my Baja videos, well, in the new series that I we're gonna be producing in two months, but I keep mentioning them. Eventually, we ended up being uh, three hours apart, four hours yeah. apart. You're going south, I, w I really needed to go north. Like, I was already behind to go to Canada, and we never hooked up. So, uh, they messaged me a few days ago. They were like, oh, we're coming to BC Overland Rally, presenting Kim and Stockout, all that uh, traveling in Australia material, port in Berig. I'm like, I so want to do it one day. So, introduce yourself, guys. I'm Lee Wei. My name's Ryan. Ryan Huff. Yeah, so we're Overland with us. Um, we've had the blog for several years. We've been doing Instagram the last couple of years, I guess, kind of on and off. Um, yeah, we're kind of semi-retired and like to travel a lot and we'll be shipping our vehicle to Iceland and doing Morocco and all that stuff. And going through Asia, right? Like in a month, basically, you're doing, starting to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be in Europe a lot. And this time you're taking your Sprinter here. Yep. Yeah, the Sprinter van. Whereas going. Australia, you did your which uh, Land Cruiser? We did the 80 series Land Cruiser. We had the Lexus version, so it was the LX450, and we took our adventure trailer, chaser trailer, to carry extra fuel and all that because we did really remote tracks um, like the Canning Stock Route and the Simpson Desert uh, across the Outback. So that was four years ago now. Yeah, and we were there for three months. And again, how, how long did it take to research that one? Like to <laughs> build your confidence and everything? Yeah. I would huh? say two to three years. Seriously, two yeah. to three years. Wow. That's. And the main thing is we were trying to do the really remote tracks. Um, the Canning Stock Route is 1,300 miles, like 2,000 kilometers, and we weren't sure we'd have the range with our petrol 80 series okay. Land Cruiser. I guess that's what you're gonna do the car Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, guys, it's, it's, yes, I actually, well, yesterday I already hanged out with these guys. We had some beers and whatever talk. I showed to them some places here in BC to camp because you guys are gonna be here five days yeah, in BC, yeah. something like that. And then slowly, slowly, they're getting to Maine, right? I think you're shipping yeah. from Maine. And uh, do that whole one year tour, yeah. which is, I'm so jealous. Yeah. <laughs> Just wanna like be your camera guy, run around, shoot your adventure. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, do the presentation. Before we get to the presentation, let's check out their Sprinter event. This is the vehicle we're gonna be taking to you. Him? Her? But, uh, we don't really have a name for the Sprinter, do we, Liwei? Wonderloaf. Oh, uh, Wonderloaf. Liwei likes to call it the Wonderloaf because it's kind of like a bread truck, bread delivery truck. So we have the uh, flip-up sink right there. So it's pretty hidden. We cook with um, an induction cooktop, so we just pull that out and plug it in. We tried to do no propane for heat or cooking or otherwise. We just wanted to do all electricity, hot water boiling, all that. Uh, how many panels do you got then? We have 420 watts worth of solar, so that's three solar panels up there. And battery bank? Yeah, we have 360 amp hours of lithium iron phosphate, and I did all the electronics myself. Okay, so that's basically full 360. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. Acid and yeah, 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 it's a lot. Yeah, and in the daytime you can, boom, it's all charged. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Half a day even. Yep, right? we're back up to being charged right now. You can see the meters in the middle. That center one is the lithium iron phosphate. Here we have our um, table that slides out. Um, Underneath here we have all of our water, so 25 gallons, 20 gallons here, and then under the sink we have another 5 gallons of water. And we just take gray water into another uh, jug and we just kind of cycle that in and out as needed. And it's got the little foot pump here. So we don't even need electricity and we find that we use a lot less water that way because we can just push the, the uh, foot pedal when we need it. The medic fridge, 12 volt obviously, right? Yep, it's 12 volts, it's huge, it's like 140 liters, it's really efficient. Yeah. I'm actually amazed. It's, it's all kind of jumbled in there right now. <laughs> yeah, whatever, it's fun, it works and it's deep and it's good. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, like, it's big. Yeah, it's big, yeah. that's nice. It's a little mess right now, we're giving that presentation. <laughs> But we have um, all of our duffel bags here of clothes. We have some kind of 
food area up there and overflow clothes for the winter and stuff that we don't use that often up here. When we go and park on unlevel ground, uh, it always sucks because you either have to level the whole vehicle or you have to sleep crooked. So um, I designed this bed and have a patent pending on the bed. But, Are you serious? Yeah, we can actually level the bed here. Oh yeah, that's right, because the uh, engineer. Yeah. <laughs> so we can kind of tilt it at any angle we want. So that's kind of a cool thing that that, um, is cool, man. that we came up with, and Brian from Goose Gear helped us uh, help us implement it. So it's still kind of in the prototype stage, but he's going to build one someday. Um, over here we have spare parts, spare fluids. Um, this is all our tools. We have, a, big box we have a lockable cabinet there, so we right now we have recovery gear and some okay, other that's stuff that's in there. That's a big box sink here, kind of recovery gear. That is all our batteries and our inverter. Ah, so okay. That's the battery box. Let's get to the presentation. Um, so shipping costs. We use this company called Aussie Car Imports and Bill Newell is the guy who owns the company. Um, he was really helpful so we basically paid him to make a lot of this stuff go as smoothly as it could. Um, we did not try to figure out all the paperwork and the temporary vehicle import and the car registration all, all ourselves. So it costs us a little bit more, but unless you want to become a shipping expert or unless you already are, like use a service like this that's a little bit more full service would be our advice. Um, so we'll talk about cost for a second. Um, since we had the trailer, we needed three quarters of a 40 foot shipping container. So if you're just sending a Land Cruiser or a Defender or something like that, it would be a 20 foot shipping container. So that would make it a little bit cheaper than what you're going to see here. But it costs us $6,200 US dollars to get over there. Um, and then another $500 for the quarantine service to, to clean it subsequently. Uh, and then back, since there's less traffic going back, it was $5,500 and then some unknown $1,200 fee for the vehicle sitting in customs for a month for some unknown reason. Which is kind of disappointing, but that's kind of our experience is um, the governments kind of go back and forth and like, oh, you need to sign this paper, you need to sign that, and it's kind of in a black hole and there's really nothing you can do, unfortunately. Maybe if you're a lot more sophisticated, you could do something, but... Um, and then, okay, so is this shipping cost? Like, some of the, our batteries died because it was sitting inside and the solar panels weren't working. Um, they drained all of our AC um, refrigerant because it wasn't necessarily the right 1997, or they couldn't ensure that it was the right 1997 uh, coolant, if it was the RJ12 or not. So, like, we had to get that recharged for several hundred dollars when we got there. So it's like all these extra costs really aren't shipping costs, but they really kind of are. Um, so I think we kind of have a rough round number of assume it's going to be like 13,000 and we've heard shipping prices have gone up even more. Um, so I don't know what the right number is, but just be prepared if, if you think it's going to be this for it to be higher. Um, you also have to get the temporary uh, vehicle registration. Again, that's not really a shipping cost, but in order to do anything with your vehicle, you got to pay that too. So there are a lot of costs involved. Uh, one thing Phil was able to do is say like, oh, get registration in this state because it was much easier uh, to pass the inspections and the paperwork was easier. So he was able to do that for us. So the schedule, um, it really should take about two months to get there uh, and two months to get back, but it uh, took another month again, um, carne issues, um, it couldn't really, not a lot of people ship to Australia from the US, so it's not something that happens every day, so they kind of were sitting on the paperwork and fed Xing the paperwork back and forth like the actual physical paperwork so um, that cost us an extra month and delayed the beginning of our trip 
And on the way back, um, we still had the same, you know, one month issue that nobody could really say what was wrong. And then um, Phil was trying to ship, uh, fill up the shipping container, which cost us another two months um, getting it back. And that was fine because we didn't need the vehicle and we wanted it to be cheaper. So, you know, there's always that could, that, that, that could occur too. And that would be something you'd have a certain amount of control over you know, how much you want to spend, how fast you want it to get back. So. And if you guys have any questions, just yell out. So we shipped into Brisbane where Phil has a, a holding area and his business is out of Brisbane, but he, he deals with the other ports as well. I spent about two and a half weeks waiting for it to come through quarantine and deal with all the paperwork. Um, so Ryan delayed his flight in. When I went to pick it up, it was cleared um, in quarantine and it was quarantined with some tanks so had fun when I went to pick it up this is what it looked like and there was barely any fuel I hardly made it to the fuel station to fuel up just pay attention to where the closest places to fuel because you may not have much distance because they, they don't want you to have full tanks when you ship yeah, it right we they were quite empty fuel as possible so when it did come out of quarantine, I got it all hooked up and packed up and I drove down to Sydney. So I spent about a week going down the coast. It was lovely. Um, just kind of using the rest stops as camp areas. They were quite nice. Bathrooms, people were camping and it wasn't a, a classic camp area. I met Ryan down in Sydney and just did some tourism stuff with him. You can see it's just a nice, beautiful, big city. We had delayed purchasing some things that we were going to add to the truck before going to the Outback, thinking that Airbnb would be a little cheaper there, but we found out it is not. It was cheaper in the U.S. for us, but it was, it was like a kid in a candy store in the ARB stores are everywhere. So we spent a few days in the streets of Sydney adding some things, some last minute things before heading to the Outback. So you can see the distance here from Sydney to the Simpson Desert. It took us about five days to get there. When we left Sydney, it was raining. And when we got up into the Blue Mountains, there was snow. And I think a lot of people weren't used to snow because there were people off the sides of the road and some of the highways were closed. So this is in the our first experience with the dirt. Um, the red, classic red Australian dirt. And before going, we've been to a lot of the Overland Expos and the rallies and just talking to people who've been to Australia. And they warned us that the road trains are, are can be a little dangerous. Do you guys know what the road trains are? So they're big rigs with multiple trailers behind them. In this one, it's a two-way traffic, but it's only one lane that's paved. So when you see them coming at you, the, the advice that we had was to get off of the paved portion and turn your windshield away from them because they'll kick up rocks and break your windshield. And they will not slow down for you. I'm sure it's going. But they go fast and they're not going to stop for you. If they slow, the trailers start doing this. Yeah. It's more dangerous. Exactly. So these were our first wild kangaroos that we saw. Um, in the outback, they were quite timid around places where people feed them. They will crawl right up you and ask for food, which made me very nervous. Out here, they, they were very timid. So we were on the way to Birdsville, which is the gateway to the Simpson Desert, just camping along the way. This is the Birdsville Hotel, which we found out hotels are actually bars and not hotels. And we spent six days in the Simpson Desert, Ryan's going to talk about that. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the route that we did next. Um, just a little plug for expos and rallies like this. You, you talk to people who've traveled all over the world. And if we hadn't talked to Rob from HEMA Maps, HEMA Maps is a big uh, mapping company in Australia, as you guys know. Um, we met him there <coughs> next. And kind of the classic route that most people do is this QAA line and then drop down to the French line. It's kind of the shortest way across uh, the Simpson Desert and kind of the most difficult uh, route, so everybody likes to do that one. Um, but he's like, ah, forget that, you know, it's just a bunch of people who are trying to tick off a box and get through it really fast in like two days. He's like, drop down this K1 line and then go on this rig road. And the reason that people don't really like the rig road is because theoretically big rigs at the right time of year 
can actually make that um, uh, make that track because they service some kind of wells and stuff like that out there. But it turned out it was really remote. We saw nobody on this K1 line at all, and only basically like two or three couples that were traveling together um, on the rig road. We did see actually one greater and one big rig kind of come in the opposite way also, but it was really remote. Nobody was down there, so it was really cool. Um, and then we had to pop up to the French line and got to see some of the more, you know, classic Simpson. But anyway, just a little plug for, you know, like going out and really talking to people as opposed to just seeing what everybody else does on the internet, I guess. So this is up us fueling up. Um, we put no more than four full jerry cans on the roof. Um, it was $5 at the time, U.S. dollars per gallon. Um, so that's what, like a dollar twenty-five U.S. per liter. Uh, yeah, you guys can do all the conversions. I guess <laughs> this is a few years ago too. So this is looking at the top of the tallest dune. Most of the dunes were not this tall, but that's the big one to kind of kick off the uh, Simpson Desert on the east side. <laughs> So I don't know if you could see that, but in the distance in the video, there was another dune. So kind of the Simpson is parallel dune after parallel dune, and it could be anywhere from a couple hundred yards to a mile or so in between these dunes. So this is just a Google image, but it's just like literally a thousand dunes. I don't, you know, 997, I know everybody has a different number that they count, but yeah, it was basically this for six or seven days, I guess six days. So you can kind of see here, we're at the top of a little dune here. And then there's this interstitial area, which is usually flat, and some of them can be mucky if there's been a lot of rain. So you want to not drive if it's been really wet and you're kind of going through a salt pan. Sometimes there are bypasses, not always. But in the distance here, you'll see the next dune. And most of them were only about 50 feet, I would say, on average. So the dunes weren't that tall. Uh, Leeway is in a head net for some reason, and it's because of all these flies. They just want to like be with you and be in your orifices and suck your moisture. I don't know. Do you guys know what they do? Is it just about the moisture? Or? Yeah. So you wear the head net, and then they're not messing around with you so much. So we met some characters in the outback. This guy waved us over, and everyone stops to talk to everybody. He came over and he pulled out his big knife, handed it to Ryan and said, hold this to your wife, I want to take a picture. <laughs> so this is that picture. Um, he was hilarious. He told us he was the original Crocodile Dundee and he was crawling under our trailer, looking at our trailer, telling us that our steering wheel is on the wrong side of the vehicle. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, super fun people that we met. Uh, we also met some fun characters. There are feral camels in the outback. There's about, I think, over a million would you guys say? <laughs> um, which is a huge problem because they don't have any predators. Um, so there's a large population out there. And these are just some of the critters that we saw out there. Very curious to go. And this is a place called Popol's Corner. It's kind of like in the U.S., the, the four corners where the four states come together, except this one is the three states. Uh, but it's just kind of really randomly out there in the middle of Simpson Desert. So it's kind of a little, like, mini attraction that people go see it, you know, do the walk around and be in all three states. So it was kind of fun. Uh, this is kind of like a typical Simpson Desert in between the dunes. There's a lot of vegetation you'll see. So these dunes are really stable. They're not blown around like in the Sahara. So I'll talk about the dune driving for a second here. Um, it's pretty hard packed sand. When it's been disturbed by tire tracks, you know, you get a little bit um, of like loose sand. And then if people drive over it more and more, and if they get wheel spin, you can have, I don't think we saw more than like five or six inches of loose sand. So it, 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 everything in our experience, there was always a base of hard sand, compacted sand. So it wasn't that hard of dune driving or sand driving, but you should practice in some kind of dunes or loose sand before you go out and attempt a trip like this would be our advice. And there are plenty of places in the U.S. at least that you can go do dune driving if you want. 
next. But sometimes there's big vegetation. Well, as if it's grass and scrubby, but uh, there's this river dome and it's like living out there amongst the dunes and nobody knows why because it usually uh, uh, makes its home on, on river banks. So there must have been some water under there, but it's kind of a mini attraction out there too. It's called the Lone Gum Tree, I think. Anyway, it's huge as you can see. So we did six days out in the Simpson Desert. We did 410 miles. We consumed 51 gallons of gasoline, uh, eight miles per gallon. Um, go back. The reason I want to say that is because we weren't able to um, see a lot of these statistics when we were looking. Like it was hard for us to judge how much fuel we need, uh, what the range of some of these routes were, like where to get gas. So I just. When we talk about the canning stock route, which was even more remote, we'll get in a little bit more detail, but that's why I'm doing this. We had 105 gallons, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We didn't we didn't have the full 105 gallons for this. We knew that the Simpson was a bit shorter than the canning, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So you need a desert park pass. It's one of their the Australia's national parks. So you need the pass. It wasn't exactly cheap. It wasn't too bad. Um, again, um, the sand isn't that soft, so you don't need a lot of speed to do it. You kind of need a little bit of momentum at times, but most of the time you just air down and you can just crawl right up. It, it wasn't difficult. Even with our trailer, it wasn't really difficult. I think we had one failed dune attempt. Um, the first time, you just back up, let a little bit more air out of the tires, get a little bit more me momentum perhaps, and it was fine. So it's not it's not that difficult if you're somewhat savvy and have some practice. What direction <laughs> Probably like 20 in the rear, 15 in the front, and 12 on the trailer is kind of our standard unless we needed to go lower but again it it totally depends on your vehicle and tire size and all that we were about 6500 pounds maybe a little over when we had the um full fuel maybe as high as 7000 when we would start out on the remote sections and then um on the canning, when we went full fuel, we were right at the gross vehicle weight of the trailer, which was like 27 or 2,800 pounds. But again, that's only for like a day, right? And then it you refuel and use water and all that. So we, were, we were pretty much at or a little over on both gross vehicle weights. So the next part, um, we're transiting from the end of the Simpson here up to Alice Springs. That took us a few days. We weren't really trying to push it hard. You could do it last time, I think. Uh, so this is Alice Springs. Um, next. Uh, just to show you about how far away from everything we were, we are like 10,000 miles um, from Chicago and Washington. Is there, are there any Canadian uh, cities up there? All right, anyway, we were pretty far away from home. So there's this place in Isle Springs called the Overlander Steakhouse. Um, the only reason we went, other than the name, is because they served all the interesting uh, Australian animals, so we got to try all that, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend any of it, but it was an experience. <laughs> So we had uh, one broken side view mirror uh, from the Simpson, a stick came up and broke a mirror, so we went to Toyota to see if we could replace it. They uh, unfortunately couldn't, but we had someone else replace it. But Ryan was, was drooling over the 70 series Land Cruisers that he really wanted to bring home. After that, we drove down to the Western McDonald Ranges, which were absolutely gorgeous and explored there to, to me seemed a little reminiscent of the desert southwest of the u.s lots of red rock and green it was gorgeous uh, we headed over to uluru and the olgas um, uluru also known as here rock um, changes depending on the time of day and the sunlight and as, as you walk around you can just see how immense it is it's a huge rock out in the desert um, pretty close by are the Olgas, and these are the Olgas here, and you can do nice hikes through the rock. It's beautiful. 
So we went back up to Alice Springs to, to stock up at our last supermarket stop before heading up to the canning, and this is what we, we got on our, I think it's a full-size bed in the hotel, all the food, supplies. We spent three days going up the Tanami track, and at that time it was about a third paved. I, I'm sure it's much more paved now. Um, but it was a beautiful remote track for us. We didn't really run into many people. This is just us camping on the side of the road on the way up. This was our first bushfire that we encountered, and we were told that sometimes it's natural and sometimes people might set it if their vehicle is broken down and they're asking for help, so they'll set little fires here and there. Uh, this one was natural. And some termite mounds that we saw on the side of the road. And as you can see, it was pretty well graded. It wasn't a terrible corrugated road at that time. And Ryan's going to talk about the canning. Yeah, so has anybody heard about the canning stock route? One, two, three, four, five, maybe half of us. Okay. So it took us 21 days to do this section. Some people say it's the most remote four wheel drive tracks in the world. Um, I think other areas claim that as well. Like, I don't know if it's really true, but go ahead next. So a little history on it. Um, it's a hundred year old cattle driving route, um, 1300 miles, 2000 kilometers. And it was surveyed by this guy called Albert Canning, hence the name Canning Stock Route. Um, cattle need water like every day, every 20 or 30 miles. Um, so there were 51 wells that he had to go find where the water was and dig wells, or if they were natural waters, they call them, they're kind of like exposed surface water and sinkholes. Um, so the whole point of it was to take the, um, the cattle from a coastal region in Kimberley to a coastal region in Perth to feed the uh, miners, the gold miners and other various metal miners. And you think, why wouldn't they just put them on a boat and get them there in two or three days, right? Well, it's because there's this tick that if you just went via ship, there would be enough humidity and the tick can stay on. But if you drove them across the uh, desert for two months, they would fall off. So that's why they went to all this problem is to just drive the cattle down through uh, to keep the uh, ticks from uh, infecting uh, Perth, Perth area. So it was only run like, I want to say seven times uh, that they ran kettle down it, so it wasn't even really used that much, so it was a big effort for presumably not a lot of reward, but anyway. So around the 60s, the vehicles, four-wheel drive vehicles became, you know, reliable and capable enough that people decided to start trying to drive this route. So we've heard the history says that it's these guys who did it back in 1967 in these, I don't know if these are Series 1 or Series 2 Land Rovers, but they did them in those. Uh, next. And then it kind of got more and more popular as, you know, Jeeps and other vehicles became more reliable um, in the 80s. And then the first organized tour was in 77. And are these Pinscowers or Volvos? I don't know what they are. Does anybody know? Anyway, they started doing some organized tours. And now they have these big um, productions with 6x6 G-Wagons and dual axle trailers. Um, this is a refrigerator only <laughs> vehicle and they pull a little bathroom with showers. So you will see, they, they do a couple tours um, a year during the winter. Um, so you'll probably see them out there if you go and do a trip like this. It's not like they're, it's not like Disney World where there are that many people out there, but it's just kind of interesting like how big a production it is. There are probably like 20 people on this tour, so it's not impressive, but. So that's a little bit about the history. Um, this kind of sums up the remoteness. Um, 1,900 kilometers in length is how long the whole canyon is. So how far is that really? Well, if you look at LA to Seattle and overlay it, it's about the same distance. So we drove from LA to Seattle with only one Aboriginal village about halfway in between. And this is the village, so there are probably about 20 domiciles, a few outbuildings. Uh, you can get diesel and gasoline, probably, depending on how many visitors have come through. It's good to call first and make sure you can, but that's kind of a little dodgy. Um, 
good picks. Um, yeah, so we basically skipped the first 200 kilometers of the uh, canning stock route because it was on paved roads, like behind the axle. So there's 53 gallons. So that means we needed to carry about 10 more jerry cans to get up to 105 gallons or 106, which still gave us very little margin, right? If we're at a worst case um, fuel mileage, well, like that's almost no margin. That's like five or six percent margin. That's that's a lot. I wouldn't be. Would you be comfortable with that? Yeah, yeah, right. So then I, I really got to thinking, and I'm like, well, we're probably not going to get the worst case gas mileage for the whole time, right? Yeah, there will be days maybe we get six and a half miles per gallon, but we're really more like eight and a half on average with high range on dirt roads. So I kind of started penciling it out and I'm like, I think we can probably do it. And if we don't, like, it's not like we're gonna die out there, you know, somebody's gonna come along and, you know, they'll probably take pity on us and, you know, give us a ride with a couple jerry cans. So, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, it, it was definitely one of those things like every day we're calculating fuel mileage and like, are we getting to the point of no return? Do we need to stop? Do we need to go back? How are we doing? So it was like a constant daily calculation to see if, if what we're doing was right. Did you ever run out? No. 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 Um, in the end, on the, um, well, so if we got the high, the more realistic gas mileage, we would uh, use 75 of our, of our 106. So that was kind of Led me to believe that we probably would be able to be in the deep water. So we'll talk about fuel a little bit at the end too, and I'll tell you what, how we actually did or leave it well. So this is kind of typical canning stock route, um, two track. Lots of grass, lots of uh, uh, vegetation out there, a lot more than I thought there was going to be. This is a kind of a refurbished well here. You can see the windlass is operational. There's a bucket. They have covers over the well. Uh, so you can get water at this one. But most of the wells next are kind of just derelict, um, completely um, just in ruins. So that's more of what we saw for each well. Again, this is like a natural water sinkhole, so you could use that water for something. I'm not sure what, but we didn't use it. Uh, the obligatory scary spider picture. There's a lot of cultural heritage out there, too. I, mean, I kind of liken it to the cowboy and Indian wars in the western U.S. They were the aboriginal and white um, um, settlers. Uh, a lot of killing back and forth, so you'll see graves out there. And it's kind of interesting history if you read some of the history of it. Uh, we saw every couple hundred miles burn out uh, vehicles if your vehicle breaks down and it's not going to be easy to get it back. The insurance companies will tell you just leave it out there and come on in and get your ride back and we'll pay for it if you have the proper coverage. And eventually a grass fire will occur or somebody will vandalize it and most of them were burned out. Uh, this is just kind of a typical-ish campsite. Um, it looks a lot like the desert southwest in the U.S. here. Okay. Um, so we met this guy, his name was Thomas. He was German, I think. He was uh, biking the whole canning stock route. And he was supported. He would give people uh, bags of food and say, and water, uh, drop this off at well, whatever, 2387. <laughs> And he would go and you know pick that up, and people would give him bananas or water if he needed it while he was riding. So yeah, he was he just taking it to the next level. I think it took him like three months. Is that sound about right? Yeah. I don't know. Um, so here we're kind of coming down a dune, and again you'll see a lot of vegetation in the center of the dune, uh, in, in between the dunes, and then you can kind of see this next dune in the background. This one was probably 30 or 50 feet. Uh, here is some drone footage from a guy we know online, but it's a little hard to see, but it basically shows the dune, the dune, the dune, the parallel dune. So, so this is Kunamarichi. Uh, we're kind of coming into it there. They have water pretty reliably. I don't think anybody says that they never have water, so I think it's, it's pretty known that they'll have water there. Um, they don't like taking pictures inside the town, so it's some kind of Aboriginal thing. I'm not, I don't really know the history there, but um, this kind of picture outside the town just kind of set the tone. It's, it's kind of 
it's kind of, yeah, kind of run down little villages, um, so don't expect a lot of services that are happen next. Uh, for instance, when we were hoping for food, I'm like, oh, look at this nice thick cut bacon. And so I bought it, and I'm like, yeah, I want bacon. And it turns out they were eight month old spare, whip, spare ribs. Um, they were frozen, so just don't expect to be able to get any fresh food. Maybe if you're lucky, like the, the truck will have just come in, maybe you can get some lettuce or something. But yeah, just don't don't expect to really get anything other than maybe can. Like you're not going to starve if you pull in for nothing, but it's not going to be necessarily what you want. Uh, so it was ten gallon, ten dollars a gallon at the time. So it was expensive, uh, but there's really nothing else you can do. They're trucking it in from hundreds and hundreds of miles away, so it was expensive. This is just a typical campsite on the canyon. This is Lake Disappointment. Um, it's an area that was named because a long time ago when people were wandering around the area, they saw this in the distance and they thought it was water, but when they saw it, it was a big salt pan. So they were quite disappointed. It's a beautiful spot. We didn't run into people or hear people for days. And our, unfortunately, our, our satellite communicator, we had a, a worm at the time now, Garmin Inreach, had stopped working here. So all our family and friends thought we were stopped there. Um, and I'll talk about the emergency plan later. Beautiful sunsets. There are amazing stars in the outback. There's no light pollution. We didn't see any planes going overhead. It's super quiet. This was our first and only water crossing on the canning. Um, as you can see, it was pretty uneventful, but it was quite dry when we were there. There are years that are wet and the track is, is not passable and people either go around or they wait a few days to let it settle. Um, but you can see it, it can, and this was on the can, it can get quite bad if it's wet. Well, we were super lucky So this is what I said, like everything we did was pretty easy, non-technical, but if you are trying to push through when you shouldn't be, like it can be difficult and people have bad, difficult recoveries out there. So if, you, if you're not trying to rush yourself, like you should be able to mitigate a lot of that. And I'm just going to scroll through some pictures. Um, we, we found a carcass of the trailer, which like the vehicles are, are there. We used our roof rack a lot just to view the wildlife as well as to collect firewood along the way so we can have a fire in the evening. And this guy is just, it was really fun to watch the camels. This is one of the oases uh, along the sea, uh, canning. Uh, we spent, I think, two or three days there just to kind of relax and recoup, and we, we connected with some friends. As you can see, there's a lot of shade and a lot of water. Yeah, they should all. And we just kind of wandered around and went hiking. Saw the flora and fauna. Ryan chased this guy who was about four feet long into <laughs> into the bush to go get a picture. So on the, towards the southern end of the canning stock route, you start getting into station land, which is their ranch land. So you'll see some more structures down there and the wells. And this is just us at the end of the canning. I was super happy. Three weeks yeah, on the canning was, was that. difficult for me. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, at the end, there's yeah. the Waluna yeah. Hotel, which we heard has been closed, but we had a celebratory beer at the end. <laughs> so the canning statistics, it took us 21 days to get through. We did 1,100 miles. We used 148 gallons of fuel total, and our average was 7.5 miles per gallon. So kind of right in between that worst case number and our kind of average high speed, high range before we drive our rain, so. And we used about 40 gallons of water and we did use the well water for showering. Uh, the best part for me was the people that we met along the way. 
the, these two couples, we were kind of camping with them every two to three days. Whenever we ran into them, they were running about the same speed as we were. We were probably by far the slowest humans on the canning stock route, and the only Americans that we ran into. People were making fun of my accent on the radio. So lessons learned with the canning, an ideal size for a vehicle be Land Cruiser size. Um, they, they do have larger vehicles on there. Um, there have been some logs and had some issues on the canning. Um, the sand dunes were not bad for us. You know, make sure you air down, know your vehicle. Um, vehicle preservation is key. We checked all our bolts. We were under our vehicle every day and making sure everything was okay. And luckily, we didn't have any catastrophic failures, but people do. A lot of people go really fast and try to go through and seven, I think we met people that were going in seven days across the whole thing. And you're flying through there if you're going that fast. Um, and lightweight is better because I'm super overloaded and have some catastrophic failures out there. Our lessons learned is it wasn't as difficult as we thought it was going to be. Um, of course, things can go wrong. We had very good luck with weather. Um, vehicle preservation, vehicle prep, <laughs> research, um, it, it all helps to make it a little more smooth. For me it was difficult, the duration of it, three weeks of being so remote, um, and the monotony of it was tough on me. The corrugations, we, we figured there were about two million corrugations that we hit. Um, this, this is a video of it. They're about three or four inch high corrugations. You can put a beer can in there. It's not quite up to the top. Um, they can be pretty nasty. There was never really a sweet speed to get through the corrugations. You're just going slow, slow and steady to get through them. And I would say typically we were going five to 15 miles per hour on the nice lake beds that are nice and smooth, maybe 30 miles an hour, but that was pretty max. Um, other things that it is remote, but it is well traveled. Uh, we did average five vehicles per day that we would see on the route, but we did go two and a half fish days at a time, a couple times without hearing or seeing anybody on the radio, no one on the track. So it can be pretty lonely out there. Um, we found that a rectangular bucket for the wells, if you're going to use your own bucket, is a little better than a round bucket as far as getting it down in the water and being able to retrieve the water. Um, with carrots and potatoes, use paper bags, don't put them in plastic, they rot. <laughs> um, ultra pasteurized milk in the containers is nice because you, you don't have to refrigerate it and you can have it throughout your journey. Um, and water bladders, which we learned from the Australians, that so like wine in a box with the bladder, they have water in a box with the bladder, and once you empty the liquid, you can blow it up and change the volume to put it in your fridge so your food isn't jiggling around, which I thought was a nice tip that they gave us. Yeah, so uh, is there somebody at four? Uh, Mario and Tequila, Jason. Okay. <laughs> so we're good. All right, we can, we can talk over Mario. Um, so permits, theoretically, you don't need a permit because it's a gazetted road, which means it's public road, I guess? I, don't, I never really understood that term. Um, so as long as you stay on the main track, you don't need a permit. But as soon as you go off and see some of the wells, you need a permit from the aboriginals. So, um, yeah, you should probably get it because you're going to want to go and see some of the cool sites. We had never had anybody ask us for it. Um, yeah, just... So we, after the canning, we just spent a few days sightseeing. We went through the gold fields. There's some huge gold pits there, the super pit. Uh, we wandered around the southwestern coast, which was absolutely beautiful. Camped along the coast, super white sand beaches, very blue water. Kangaroos were hanging out on the beach, sunbathing. Uh, a little more agricultural land. I have three already. I really don't need more. And the large Trees. So we were just making our way to Perth where we were shipping out of. So we spent a couple days in Perth packing up stuff so that we could ship our vehicle back. 
Yeah, so I guess our advice um, is just, you know, if you want to do something like this, just do it. You know, make sure you prepare and get some experience doing terrain like this. But, you know, a lot of people want to make some of these trips out to be bigger and harder than they are. We probably agree on this, right? Um, but I think people have vested interest in saying whatever they're doing is really hard and really difficult and amazing and, you know, saying that. Maybe you shouldn't try it, but we say the opposite. Um, but yeah, do practice with full gear. <clears throat> if you're going to do some of these long remote tracks, like go out and do the Mojave Road or some of these long distance tracks you can do in Canada or the US and actually be out there. Don't like stop in Baker and get an ice cream um, just because it's right there along the road and you're crossing. You know, actually be out there for a week or something like that where, you're, where you are truly unsupported um, because it's a different mindset. That was the hard part about the trip is just being out there for that long and you don't really have an option to go get that ice cream so you just got to be really comfortable with what you can handle and monitor your fuel mileage and your water usage and all that so you don't get into any problems out there uh, communications um, do you know what a personal locator beacon is it's basically like you're sailing out in the middle of uh, the ocean and um, you push that button and it puts out the beacon and the Coast Guard comes and finds you. They basically have a, a land-based version of that and it's called a PLD. So we took that. Um, I'm not saying that's the right answer, but if all your other communication devices fail, that's like a governmental uh, monitored one. So that's probably about your best chance of getting somebody out there, but it's not going to be like the helicopter you in. I mean, it's, it's so remote that you basically can't get to you. Um, uh, there's a motorcyclist who broke his arm and they um, sat pho phoned the local authorities and they're like, okay, you can you can take three or four days to have somebody drive you out or you can wait two or three days for us to come and drive in and another two or three days to get you back out. So, you know, you got to be pretty self-sufficient, comfortable with your medical uh, knowledge and what you can handle or not. So just because you have all these devices doesn't mean things are just going to happen. It's, it's too remote for them to get helicopters and stuff like that in there. Kudamarichi, I think, that, that I'm pretty sure they have an airstrip. Almost 100% sure they have an airstrip. So it's kind of like beginning and center, and then maybe they'll land on a dry lake. I don't know. It's, it's It'd be rough. So satellite phone, I, a lot of people had them out there, but we just had our texting device, which ended up not working part of the way through. So the UHFCB is kind of what everybody out in the outback uses. Um, and that gives you a range of like, you know, one mile to 20 or 30 miles, depending on line of sight and all that. So we would suggest taking that just so you can coordinate and get help locally. Um, basically, the mobile phones didn't work on these really remote tracks, but getting to and from the tracks, like you can probably get service. And if you can, Telstra was the best. At least four years ago. Yeah, so um, thanks for coming. If anybody is interested in doing this trip, we have uh, two slides here at the end you can take pictures of. Uh, we have cards here. If you guys want to email us, we can send you this presentation or Dropbox it or something. Uh, but yeah, it was a really cool trip. Uh, sending your vehicle over there was kind of a pain. You know, do it if you're going to be out there a year. If you're going to be there for a couple weeks, don't ship your vehicle. You know, our money just a big pain. So. I don't know. Any questions? And if anyone's curious about our emergency plan, we had a very detailed emergency plan that we shared with our friends and family, and it's on our blog, so you can read it. Um, it kind of talks about our vehicles, what what equipment we have, um, and and kind of the timelines and giving it two to five days, depending on which track, for them to wait, even if they don't hear up from us before they contact the authorities. So it's kind of a safety. Um, but if you guys are interested, it's on our blog, so you can read it. It's a quite detailed <laughs> Does anyone right, cool. have any questions? So you did wild camping all the way, most of the time? Most of the time. In, in, on the canning I mean, and the Simpson, yes. Um, from like the end of the Simpson up to Alice Springs, we kind of were in tent campgrounds 
RV campgrounds, um, I don't know, maybe half the time, just because there were showers and water and all that fun stuff. But yeah, you didn't have to, it's just showers are nice and a few things. Hey comrades, don't forget to hit that like button and also leave a comment. And if you haven't subscribed yet, you should by hitting that subscription button and also bell notification next to it. So you can actually get my video updates, both in notification and your video feed. And as well, you can support this channel if you like my videos through PayPal or Patreon in the links down below or just after this video.